St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many, but the church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and difficult cases. Pray for me to need God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedily help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations, and sufferings, particularly and that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jude, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. St. Jude, pray for us and all who honor and invoke thy aid. Amen. We begin this morning by rereading part of our first reading. We are today from 1 Thessalonians. We give thanks to God always for all of you, remembering in your prayers unceasingly, calling to mind your work of faith and labor of love and endurance and hope of our Lord Jesus Christ before our God and Father. Knowing, brothers, loved by God, how you were chosen, for our gospel will not come to you in word alone, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with much conviction. You know what sort of people you were among the, were among, were you, before you were for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, receiving the word in great affliction with joy from the Holy Spirit. This particular passage I reread because it's actually the full version. I've always wondered, and, and I, I don't, I've always um, been confused, why is it is that sometimes that certain verses are skipped when we have our readings. You ever notice there's quite a, number, quite a few numbers sometimes, like this morning, and, and they skip the, the, the verse on joy, and I'm not really sure why. I remember one time in Anchorage, I was, was just first ordained, I was assigned to the cathedral in Anchorage, and, and I knew enough scripture to get myself into trouble, right? So, in the Gospel of John, chapter 5 and 7 go together. And then 5 was going, those, those readings were going through chapter 5, and then going through chapter 7, and it was building towards where Jesus proclaims, I am the water of life, all who come to me, all who thirst come to me and drink. And I get to that day, and I just assumed it was going to be there, and no, they went on to another chapter. <laughs> so all this build up. And so I've always, I've always just wondered about that. So one of the things that one day I'll, I'll, I'll understand. But this particular line on joy, we have to come back to, because joy was something we spoke about yesterday in the life of St. Monica. Now sometimes when we throw these things out there, they can be vague. They're kind of a vague concept. And there are several things that, that Paul mentions here that can remain just vague. That we throw out there and that we're supposed to just do somehow. So, joy. And I talked about joy a little bit, but what is, what is joy, really? Now, Father Michael had said, remember, a few weeks ago, and then I said, too, it's not an emotion, exactly. And joy doesn't follow the natural course of things. The things I described in the life of St. Monica, or some of the things that we experience, doesn't bring about joy. Affliction and trial alone do not bring about joy. They just don't. They bring about burden especially in our day and age where we can be very busy and, and I actually I would think the world is a little bit overwhelming at times. There's too many things, too much information. It stops our joy. That doesn't mean that necessarily each one of those things is bad. That's not the point I'm making. I'm just saying that the trials, tribulations, burdens, busyness don't bring joy in themselves unless one finds in the particular action something that brings them some sort of Joy, But I would propose perhaps that's more a different kind of joy, maybe an emotional sort of joy, which isn't, isn't bad. When we speak about joy, and then Paul says here that the gospel came to you not only in word, 
that is the spoken word that he's speaking about here. So whenever he uses the word, he can also be speaking about Christ, but in a particular way he's speaking about the word, the power of the preached word coming to you. Then, you see, the power of the Holy Spirit that informed that word is coming to you too. It's an interesting way of saying it. We, don't, we, have, we, we think about the Eucharist, rightly, how we receive God or the sacraments. But Paul's also talking about how the word then preached is this vehicle that opens our minds and hearts to the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, the Holy Spirit and full conviction. Full conviction is again, with Paul, sometimes we get confused. Paul has never talks about stirring up something from nothing. It comes from the power of God. It's God that gives that, that faith, that belief. And so, this joy is, is unfolds then by, by this power given to us uh, through the Holy Spirit. So there is a mystery here. When you think of the Beatitudes in the Gospel, we say, how can good things come about these difficult things? But there is that paradox of Christ, there's that power of Christ working there, that joy is brought about by the un, uh, unconditional acceptance of the Word of God. So even when we overcome obstacles, there's a different thing going on. And you see, in a, you can still look at a tumultuous river, or, or even one frozen over in the, in, in the winter. Underneath is the calm water. You know, and it is calmer beneath, usually. There can be currents. But if you look at the river, and you see, I was just up, in fact, with the student brothers up at McKenzie Bridge on the retreat house, and there's this river, this, this fast river that goes forth. But you see, and you look below, if you can see and the light is correct, You'll see the, the trout below hardly doing anything sometimes. But there's a stillness there. And that's what we see here with the, the, the soul, ideally. Well, many things can go on in the world. You know, just because we've sought God, and sometimes we get confused by this, we seek God, there are not going to be storms in our life. There's not going to be trials, tribulations, difficulties, afflictions, sadness. Oh no, it, there still is. And I don't know about your experience, but sometimes there's more. Sometimes we have to bear more than, they, than everyone else. Why? Because we have the power to do so. By ourselves? No. By the gift of God, by the gift of the Holy Spirit that stills the heart. So Christ within this vessel that we are, stilling the storms, and there's a quiet within. And it's there in that unity with God then there is a joy. So St. John Chrysostom had said that one can be joyful despite lashes and blows because they accepted the cause of Christ. That's what we get in our tradition. It's more in our tradition than in Scripture. The happy embracing of Christ in the cross. It's in some of the mystic traditions. And as sometimes you see it in film that Christ embraces his cross, literally speaking. Why does he do that? Even though he struggled too in his humanity in the garden. Because of this union with the Father. And so us too, by the gift of the Holy Spirit and that unity, then we can embrace the Lord. And so even though there's difficulty, even in our emotions, we say, this is sad, this is difficult, I don't want to do this. You know, we can, we can with our union with God, it will bring us a certain amount of, of joy, one hopes. And this is, as we say, a fruit of the Spirit. So fruits, the fruits are present always, but fruits grow throughout our life, ideally. So just like the virtues. We can see the virtues and, and gifts of the Holy Spirit as uh, gifts and fruits as a sort of tree. You know, the, um, In baptism, actually, all of these things are given. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are given. We don't always know how to use them yet. It's like the seed planted in our heart, the Word of God. And so the gifts are given, but they must grow. And they form the way the virtues work. I'll speak about the virtues in a second. And then it's sort of over time, the fruits become more prevalent, if that makes sense. So, looking then, Paul mentions virtue. And if you've come to St. Dominic's before, I assume, I don't know, I haven't been here that only a few months, I assume some of the priests have preached on virtue. Because virtue is so important. Virtue is so beautiful. 
So this is the first mention of the theological virtues in Scripture. This is his earliest mention. Paul mentioned them more than once, but I believe this is the first time. Faith, hope, and love. This is the first time he mentions that. It's become so central to our faith, but something I think that's worth coming back to for a second. Now, what are virtues again? To understand virtues, because it gets complicated in a way, it can. It's a kind of philosophy and theology. But it's really easy to understand vices. The opposite of virtues. So what are vices again? Vices are bad habits. And both the secular society and the Christian society speak of them as bad habits. Now, in secular society, what's a, what's a vice? We often think of a drinking, gambling, smoking. Okay, why are those vices? Because they're dirty somehow? Not exactly. It's because they're habitual. They're not good for you, necessarily. Certainly not in any sort of, of um, excess. And they quickly, be, they quickly become vices, don't they? And they're, and they're why? Because they're, they're, and why is it hard to get away from, from, those, from those particular activities for some people? Because there's an element of addiction. And there's an element of what's called a habit. We get used to it. So, we really see this when we talk about Christian vices. I'm going to talk about complaining yesterday. We're going to talk about anger. We're going to talk about rash judgment. Why are we so good at those things? Gossiping. Some of us, uh, as, as I like to point out, are, are, are experts in these things. Experts in anger. Experts in, 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 in rage. In judging others. We're good at it. Why? Because we've worked at it. We're really good at it. Because we make it a habit. You see, this is a vice. So a virtue is the opposite. A virtue is a good habit. Good habits clearly are more difficult to form. But when we talk about faith, hope, and love, and also the cardinal virtues, justice, prudence, temperance, and fortitude, we're talking about good habits. So again, these concepts we throw out there can sometimes be vague, or something that we're just supposed to do. You know, tomorrow I'm just going to start with, I'm just going to be just. Well, no, that takes working on. I'm going to have faith. It takes working on. Now, these gifts are infused in us by the gift of the Holy Spirit at baptism and strengthen in confirmation. But it takes for us then to use those things received and build them into a habit. And so faith, hope, and love that Paul mentions today are things received by God, but they're also as of tools that we need to learn to use. So, for example, if I give you a violin, okay, what am I supposed to do with it? So we're going to make them a very ugly sound with this particular violin, unless you know how to play. And working on music takes practice. It takes virtue. It takes learning these things well and doing them after much practice and learning it becomes a natural sort of thing. There's a great teacher, uh, um, he has passed away, Father Sovias Pinkers, who, who uses the example of, of music, which other earlier fathers had used, but he also used the example of language. Language is not easy at first, but once you learn it, 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 it becomes, you don't have to think about it each time, ideally, but it becomes a habit, a good habit where one speaks. And so faith, hope, and love are like this. Faith, hope, and love given and infused by God, but then something we work on. This is why Paul says in, 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 his, in his letter to Timothy, he's encouraging the fan, the spark he's received into a flame. He's say, he's, in another way, he's saying, work on the virtue. You've received this from God, but it's up to you then to make it strong. Yes, there's the power of God, His mercy, the strength of the Holy Spirit. We rely on this each day, but we must respond too. And so faith, when we come to faith, faith then is also a virtue. There's a direction in faith, right? There's an, what we call the object of faith. And the primary, the greatest object of faith is God. So it's belief and faith in God. This isn't stirred up in ourselves either. This is a gift given by God. Because we believe is because it is, God has led us to believe. Why this mystery unfolds this way, I don't know. But it does. But it's for us then to respond in a, in a new way. This is why St. James, the Apostle in his letter, says, faith without works is dead. We often make a dichotomy here. 
or certainly sometimes other Christian uh, faiths do as well. But for us, the two are, are not just hand in hand, right and left. The two are intimately together. Faith, for us, is not only then what is believed and directed towards God, but then it is right action. It is then faith, that belief put into practice. Because faith, then, is a virtue directed towards God alone, it makes all of our actions, ideally, directed, maybe not immediately, but ultimately to God alone in the Christian life. So all things we do are directed towards God. We should remember that, especially when we do things we don't want to do. And maybe some of us then, you know, have a, go visit this member of our family, we don't want to do it. Or we do this, we don't, maybe we, hey, maybe we, we need to pray and we're not in it today. We need to pray. But we do it because faith directs us to do it. That direction towards God. Or our daily work, going to work, for some people it's a burden, more than a joy, that then we do this with God at the end. We make things then given to us by the Lord, put in our life as works of faith. As works of faith. Paul mentions charity. I spoke a little bit about love yesterday, the encounter with love, quoting Father Michael's uh, summary of St. Thomas Aquinas. Love, of course, then when we talk in the Christian sense, is, is, is different. We talk about Love in God, we can only speak about it in an analogous way. I can talk, we can talk about our love of an earthly thing or, or one another or our families. We can talk about our human love of God, but God's love is something much greater. God's love is something beyond our understanding. And yet, we are called then in, to understand this sort of love as it under, unfolds in our life. For example, in, in the Gospel of John, this Jesus says to love one another as I have loved you. What, if you really think about it, it's not possible. So it's to imitate God in this particular way. And God gives the ability to grow in this virtue in our life by the gift of his power, the gift of his strength. So that love then helps us then to love in a deeper way than we would naturally without the gift of the Spirit, without the sacraments. Love is helping us to grow in a deeper way and imitate God in this wonderful way. So for us, not dodging sacrifice or effort, but committing ourselves to the Lord and to others. The third one, of course, hope. Hope enables us to endure adversity, according to St. Thomas Aquinas. And Paul urges us always, uh, and same in the letter to the Romans, to, to hope and be persistent even in tribulation. Because hope then, this is almost a, a trust in God. That, and it's that trust, that presence, that we're not alone. And this too, for Paul, is a source of, of joy. So all of these things in this letter today bring us to St. Monica. And we see in her these virtues at work. The virtues you notice, and at least I've always noticed, are a little overlapping. Because how do you really make a line between faith and hope sometimes? Or, or the way faith and hope inform love? It's because of a relationship with the Lord that these things really are fleshed out. That they really become real. That our faith get, and hope and love are not vague, but directed into a person, directed into Christ our God. Directed into the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Strengthened by that gift of the Spirit. It's about this relationship with, with the Lord. And this is the thing that we must ever cultivate. So yes, we must practice the virtues and help them to grow, but in faith, hope, and love, then both informed by God and directing us to live in this context, live within this, this way of following Him, because then or in addition to understanding this, this, uh, this openness then to his way of life that he would have for us. So that faith, hope, and love become always again directed, especially for many of the saints, rooted in Christ our God, rooted in, in Jesus.
rooted in the humanity of Christ. So we have hate, hope, and love of him. Faith in him, hope in him, love of him. And this ever grows. And it grows it's not when we feel necessarily good the most. It can. We often think that our prayer, uh, and, and when, it, when there's consolation and things are easy and we're happy in our faith, that that's when we grow the most. I'm not saying we don't grow at those moments, but I would propose that sometimes it's our, great, our growth and what makes St. Monica so holy is because she sought God and his sanctity even in the midst of her affliction. And she perseveres. She works at it. I don't know if she always wants to or always believes. I, there's no doubt she struggled. Let's not whitewash the stories of the saints. No way she didn't struggle. And yet, the point is that in her struggle, she chooses the Lord. She chooses to have faith in Him. She chooses to hope in Him. She chooses to love Him and love Augustine, love her husband, love her mother-in-law, love her family. And that great love, then, is so important. That love is motivates her prayer. You notice, what does Monica want for them? Say, Monica doesn't want them to be wealthy or known, or he doesn't want her husband to be a senator or an emperor or anything like this. She doesn't want these worldly things. You know, even at her death, she, 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 she's scandalized by Augustine and her brother, or his brother, because they, they, they're worried that, that, that she needs to be buried back in North Africa, where she's from. And she says, forget that. I'm not worried about that. Just put this body wherever it is. You know, she, she's focused on something else. She doesn't care about worldly things. So that virtue grows in her in this amazing way. She cares about the salvation of others. And when she looks, I'm going to say, Monica, I don't know if she would be really welcome today in one sense. Because she looks at her husband, she looks at her mother-in-law, she looks at her children. You know what she does? She judges them. Now when we say don't judge, what do we mean? We say don't condemn another. This is where, where we are very good at judging things because of the gift of the Spirit. It's a part of a discernment is one is, is especially Christian discernment is part of the gifts that come with, with the power of God. Often we misuse it. <laughs> Often we begin to start we see and we can see deeply and we start to judge others. We are to condemn others for their actions, or we gossip about them. That's vice. But we also have that other side. We can't lose this judgment. Okay, I'll tell you, you know, you, you make a judgment. Well, I don't, I, you know, for many of us, I don't see so well. I don't make a judgment every time I go up the stairs. That's a kind of judgment. We judge how we're going to drive in traffic. We judge which is something good or bad. If you decide today, should I do this or this, that's a kind of judgment. Should I go here or here? Should I do this or that? Judgment. And so when we see in people, we see, perhaps we see somebody go to the hospital and we see somebody who's ill, and we don't condemn them for their behavior that led them to that. That would be bad. So we often do those kinds of things. But we judge is that they're ill. Say, oh, this is bad. I want them to be better. I want them to be good. I want them to be happy and well. So the same thing here. When we see those who are struggling, when we see those who are lost, when we see those who are no, no God, we don't condemn them. But we do make a judgment, in a sense, that they could have more. And so this is that kind of judgment that St. Monica makes. She does not condemn them. That's the whole point. That's why they respond to her, because she's not condemning. But she does judge this, that they need God. And this is her primary concern for them, that they turn to, eternal, to, to the eternal things that are good. All people are beloved by God. Why not all people are, are receive the gift of faith immediately? This I do not know. Maybe the Lord wants us to work. Uh, he calls us then to labor in the vineyard. That could be. But all people are called to God. The Lord wants all people to know happiness. And this is, in fact, why what we say is the last end of humanity, the last end of man and woman, is happiness. Not in an earthly sense, not in a, in, a, in a kind of quantifiable sense, wealth, honors, health, whatever, just like St. Monica, but that eternal happiness. And this is what draws St. Monica so much. Does she need them to be like her? I doubt it. 
or else she wouldn't have married a Roman official. I don't know how she became the wife of a Roman official. Why? What, what was the cause there? So it's not that that she's seeking. She doesn't need... In fact, the church has never sought everyone to be the same. This is why the Catholic Church has been able to absorb so many cultures and also sometimes learn perspectives from those cultures. Beautiful ways of articulation of the faith, especially in art and in prayer. But rather, St. Monica then is seeking their eternal happiness, that supernatural goal. And this will move her to the deepest sort of prayer. And this is what moves her to those tears, which I'll speak about more tomorrow. This is what moves her, that she wants, she doesn't want them necessarily simply to be happy here for 30 years or 50. She wants them to be happy for eternity. This is her concern. This is the concern of God. This is the concern of St. Monica. And this I'll speak more about tomorrow. So just today, we know that St. Monica, again, she doesn't, she probably struggles with these people in her life. She's frustrated by them. For example, there's that one time where St. Augustine, later on in his life, he then comes back and he's all smart from studying and all these different things. And he becomes, he does the dumbest thing. He becomes a manichae. He calls a manichae in heresy. And it's such, it's, it's honestly it's a silly heresy. It, because I didn't explain it yesterday in the larger Sunday context. But if you recall, it's like the Albigensians that St. Dominic fought. And it's this kind of dualism so that everything that is spiritual is created by a good God. Everything is physical created by an evil God or an evil principle. And you would think, okay, well, that's not it. It's, sometimes it even goes to the extent that Jesus created all good things and the devil created all bad or material things. Uh, you would think, okay, well, as wrong as that is, that would keep people away from, from physical and, and sin. It doesn't for some reason. It just doesn't. This is why Albigensian culture was falling apart and St. Dominic so many centuries later was moved to compassion. It just doesn't. It actually breaks down. And so St. Monica is not only concerned about this, but then he starts speaking about this and he throws them out. She does something that many, maybe of us would do. He says, just get out of here. You, you, don't be in my house with this, these, these ideas. But then she has some sort of vision or dream and, and, the, and she's reminded that she needs to be the instrument of compassion and draw him back. And so she, again, accepts him back with compassion. Compassion is so important. Agreement? No. Lack of, of, of judgment for his good? No. But compassion? Yes. And this is a good path to follow. So she has this new response in her life, and maybe it's partly this instance that does it. But she, she follows this way of reaching out and opening herself for the other. And she does, what does it mean then to, to live out that compassion in our life? But you know, suspecting the good, not blaming uh, her family for the way they believe or what they do necessarily. They usually see they do bad things. They do some things that are not good for them, spiritually speaking, physically speaking, absolutely. But then understanding that, you know, her husband and her, her mother-in-law didn't grow up in the faith. So there's a suspecting of the good there. There, there's a, a compassion because, in a way, they don't know any better. It doesn't mean they can't grow, but we have to meet them where they're at. Perhaps in her own life, she gives of herself. She's patient. And one of the things we could learn in today's world is that, that lesson, especially in American culture, I think, we don't always have to be right. Not when nothing's at stake. Say, oh, no, no, it's blue. I saw it, it's blue. Sometimes we fight over the dumbest things. Where is that conviction of the faith when he did it? Say, to share our beliefs sometimes. Sometimes we have to be right about the silliest things, or we have to have our way in things that are non essential. It's left, not right. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes we, we fight over things that don't matter. We let go, we should let go, rather. St. Monica does. She has to let go in her life, let go of the things that aren't important, to grow in patience and charity. And she's moved above all by the deepest respect for them. She imitates God in his compassion for others. She imitates him the deepest love and desire for their happiness. Not her happiness. Though, again, her lack of happiness probably causes her to cry and weep sometimes. It's this 
love, wanting and desiring the greatest good for them, salvation, eternal life with God. And so she then puts these things into practice and acts accordingly. She lives out her faith through prayer and through action. And because of this, she grows in all the virtues, faith, hope, and love. We see this, finally, in, the, in, in Saint Dominic. You know, so often we wonder, how can we pray for these people? We're mad at them. How do I pray for them? How? You know, Saint Dominic, too, he says, a pray prays for everybody. How is that? You know, we, so we're told to pray for our enemies, but we don't know how. Not only do we want to not pray for our enemies, sometimes we don't even want them in our, you know, in our spiritual space even. We want them to go away. And, and perhaps at the beginning of prayer sometimes, you know, Lord, open their eyes or close them, we could say. You know, Lord, teach them this. And that's where our prayer begins, actually. Often, you know, say we don't have to agree with somebody, we have to like them. I don't think Jesus necessarily in his humanity was liking those who were putting them to death, and yet he prays for them. He says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. He makes that choice in his divine will and his human will to, to then choose to love the other. Chooses to love and prays for their salvation, really. That's he's praying for. The pray for their salvation. And that's where we begin to pray for those we disagree with. Those are our family, or those we call our enemy, whatever it is, to pray for them. To pray for them, and it's okay to pray for their conversion, pray for their salvation, to pray that they open their hearts to graces. Now, I wouldn't pray for what you think they need. Pray for what the Lord thinks they need. Because He knows. That's part of that letting go. Because we have to let go to the idea that we might see in our life results. How wonderful and we do, but we don't count that. We have to be detached from that and let the Lord work in his time. St. Dominic, in the biography written by Blessed Jordan, prayed for so many people. And he was, had such a deep compassion. You don't sense that there was a real judgment, uh, or at least not a condemnation in the life of Dominic. There was a judgment that people were in need. And he was brought and overcome with especially prayer for the afflicted, for those in need, for sinners, it's mentioned in the biography, for all those who did not know God. And he drew them in a special way into his heart, into the, as um, the previous preacher, Father Alan White, had talked about St. Dominic, into the sanctuary of compassion, which is within himself. When we say about the temple of the Holy Spirit, we go, but we go to a place like this, a church, to pray and be in the presence of God. But there's also that sense that we are always in the presence of God. And St. Dominic would draw them into that place of prayer, that place within that he made that belonged to God alone. Then that purity of heart and that place that be, belonged to God. St. Dominic would pray, really, without ceasing and make all kinds, even his leisure even above and beyond the other brothers, was really given to contemplation of prayer. And he scarcely, when he was at home, left the monastery or the priory where he was. But he just prayed, and they would catch him, you know, weeping for sinners, the wretched, the afflicted. And, and he would bring their sufferings with him into his compassionate heart. And this was unique. This was different among than previous forms of prayer. This was something a little bit new. Uh, often prayer was done without kind of distraction, but St. Dominic would bring then these sorts of things into his prayer and allow then, not a constant, how do you say, um, it wouldn't be a constant uh, a reflection necessarily on them, but then bringing them to his heart and not being afraid to really draw them into the Lord's mercy and beg them in that way that Abraham then would pray for those in need. And so we see this in the life of St. Dominic, and I think we could see this in the life of St. Monica, to understand a little bit that balance of how we pray for those who are very much in need. And as I said yesterday, her family did convert. Augustine, after 17 years, sometimes it takes people 57, so her prayers must be very efficacious, or, saint, saint, or the mercy of God woke St. Augustine uh, up to some, to, in some real way. So in the life of St. Monica, we see the virtues grow, faith, hope, and love. 
And she prays in this deep way, clearly, we can discern from the story, bringing then, just like St. Dominic, Augustine and her family in the sanctuary of her own heart, and praying for them there. Not judging them, not condemning them, rather, but judging that they are in need of God, and asking the Lord to be merciful, and pour that out for, for, for each one of them. Open their hearts to the mystery of his love. She weeps, too. And the reason I chose to, I'd really put this other way around, but tomorrow then the reading actually speaks a bit about, uh, about tears and, and, and the tears of uh, a particular person in Scripture, uh, most particularly. So that which we will speak about uh, tomorrow. I think I'm the only priest here who will say our St. Monica prayer, but then uh, I'll bless here with a St. Monica relic after our prayer. So let's go back to the first prayer and ask St. Monica for her, for her intercession. St. Monica, troubled wife and mother, many sorrows pierced your heart during your lifetime, yet you never despaired or lost faith. With confidence, persistence, and profound faith, you pray daily for the conversion of your beloved husband, Patricius, and your beloved son, Augustine. Grant me that same fortitude, patience, and trust in the Lord. Intercede for me, dear St. Monica, for... And grant me the grace to accept his will in all things through Jesus Christ, our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.